John McWhorter. Hey, how you doing? Good. How are you, Glenn? I am good. I'm Glenn Lowry, the Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. I'm with my conversation partner, John McWhorter. I teach at Brown. He teaches at Columbia. We are the black guys at bloggingheads.tv. That's our patented introduction. We are in the Glenn Show 2.0 era. Uh, and that's an era where we have a Patreon account and we encourage people to support us if they feel so inclined. That's uh, patreon.com uh, forward slash Glenn Show. Two ends, one word. Uh, and uh, John and I are actually uh, committing ourselves to doing a bi-weekly, is that what you call it, bi-weekly every other week uh, uh, thing, where on Mondays we'll put up new content, and uh, content at the Glenn Show will be available to uh, subscribers at Patreon as, as soon as it uh, goes up on Monday, and a few days later uh, to everybody else. Uh, so, oh, and finally, I should say the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, my employer at Brown University, along with the Economics Department, gives some institutional support to the Glenn Show. John, how you doing? I'm pretty good, Glenn. I um, am looking forward to the end of this semester because of the technological challenges of teaching via Zoom and children not really being in school, <laughs> et cetera. But things could be worse. How about you? Okay, well, as everybody can see, I am not in a recording studio. I am in what is going to be my wonderful office and what is going to be my beautiful new home that Lawan and I are moving into. Uh, but a long story made very short. We decided to take one half of the first floor of the house and completely rebuild it. Hmm. We're converting it into a bedroom suite, and I could go on about this for a long time. And there are photos. There are photos. There will be photos. Uh, and it has this beautiful back that looks out onto our backyard and our swimming pool and stuff. And there's a glass thing and there's, it's very modern. It's very chic, two-sided fireplace, tall uh, ceiling and the wood is beautiful. Uh, and I'm in my office, but it's, a, it's disheveled now with boxes with books in them everywhere. Uh, and em empty bookcases because I haven't unpacked the books yet. And, and this is going to be a process, but, uh, when it's over, it's going to be Shangri-La. This is reminding me of something I saw somebody writing on Twitter last week where the idea, this is a, a, a pretty Pacific person, but this is a, a black guy, I think a scholar who was writing that there are two kinds of black people, and I forget what he called them, but you and I are the kind who cannot say that we represent the black community because we don't have enough contact with black people, you know, never mind <laughs> that you're married to one, but I guess she's only one person, and that you know, we oh, wait interact a minute, man. I, I go out with, of my way to have contact with black people. What are you talking about? I <laughs> keep my blackness. Academics. I renew yeah. my blackness on a regular basis. <laughs> but he, he didn't think so. We are basically white people with black yeah, skin. I've heard that. We, I've heard we're just that. too assimilated. And then there's the vast majority of black people. And supposedly they have a different experience with the cops than we do, et cetera. And so we, this person wasn't dissing us necessarily, but he was basically saying that our views are suspect because we're not down enough. And you're talking about your paradise house. And I'm sitting here jealous because I live in New York City where you can't have that. But I'm just thinking you are giving fodder to that. Because Move to you're, Providence, you're Rhode Island, John. Move to Providence. We, we love to have you. Well, I, I guess I can't speak for my, my colleagues. <laughs> I, I can't guarantee that. I'm sorry, but I would love to have you. Uh, well, here's how I look at it. Here's how I look at it. Um, I am of a certain age. I've worked hard all of my life. Uh, I have been successful and I'm going to enjoy my success. I don't owe anybody an apology for that. God love you. Uh, and I did think about it because there's way too much house. It's way more house. I'm sure there's a moral argument against my house, right? My house is too big. I'm, you know, too surplus consumption or whatnot like That's that. Right. I got a swimming pool in the back. Okay. I mean, and I'm not bragging. I'm simply reporting to you uh, that, mm -hmm. you know, that that's, you know, and it, um, and uh, I've earned it. And I don't really have to apologize for that. I mean, that's not a political statement. I don't, I shouldn't be. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to me. I earned it. <laughs> well, of course, the thing is, <laughs> if you in exactly your position were saying what are considered the right things about the cops, nobody would have any problem with your swimming pool. But the oh, wait, a minute, wait a minute. I make way less money than the people with the three names. I hope that's understood. I hope that is well understood. Okay. <laughs> you know, Nobody never is giving me 25 or 30 or $40,000 a pop. 
to <laughs> give a 45 minute, well, I'm not going to comment on the quality of the address. No one's paying me that. You know, it never occurred to me that there's a <laughs> Nicole, Nicole Hannah Jones is another three name person. I never thought about that, that that's another one with the three. Although you could also say Thomas Chatterton Williams, but still, yes. Um, but those people are supposed to be exceptions and they're making all of this special money because they have this you know, special message to purvey, but their brothers and sisters out in the streets are never going to see $40,000 all at one time at all. And so, you know, uh, we're I, too, I, I don't we're too in their honoraria. I mean, it's a market and they have a product offer that people want to pay for. It's just, it's, you know, I mean, I, I I'm a, just straight down the road kind of libertarian on that kind of thing. People, I think uh, prostitution laws are probably, anyway, we could go off into law. I mean, I think people should be able to transact freely when there's gains from trade, if nobody else is hurt by it. And uh, that's what people are willing to pay them. So uh, it's more of a commentary on the market than it is on them that they're willing to be, that there are people willing to pay them that, that, that should occasion us to look at the institutions that, have the values that lead to that outcome. Yeah, uh, I think. But people are going to say we're jealous, John. Isn't that one of our themes? The black guys here at blackheads.tv, the contrarian black guys who are crit- critics of the people with three names who didn't like the, the we can name them, but you know, you know who they are. Yeah, uh, we're, no, we're jealous of their success. They got book awards and Pulitzer Prizes and stuff like that. We don't have one of those. McCarthy, where's yeah. your McCarthy? John, where's your McCarthy? That could never happen to me. Now, that's a haters going to hate kind of thing. I can see how we would look like we're jealous. I completely get it. But I can definitely say, you know, anybody who says that about me, for one thing, doesn't know me. I don't want to travel that much. I don't want to hang out that much. I want my can I Can I just embarrass you You for a minute by saying that I could write the uh, notice of the MacArthur Award to John McWhorter uh, in my sleep. It would it would not require very much effort at all. You had a very well, that, impactful career. You're still you relatively me. young. I know you don't want to hear this, but it's ridiculous that uh, we would a priori rule out the possibility that you could uh, win one of those grants. OK, but we can. And that's telling us something about our political culture. I apologize for this. I should have silenced my phone. But no, you are. You're correct. I'm on the call. Uh, so, baby, I have to talk to you later. OK. But I was just trying to say the sort of success that the people we're talking about have, I genuinely wouldn't enjoy that life. If offered that life, I would turn it down. And many people would be surprised, especially these days with Zoom, how much money I turn down where people ask me to do Zoom talks for you know, a decent amount of money. And I just say, frankly, I don't enjoy it. I want to curl up with my biography of James Beard. I don't want to talk on Zoom for an hour, even for a few thousand dollars. That's literally me. So I'm not jealous of those people. It is the honest truth. But you can see how other people would think that we are. It must look like it. And so we just have to accept that and just keep on saying what we're saying. Well, there is the irony. I mean, we can say this not only with respect to uh, uh, Black uh, writers with three names who are uh, the sometimes subjects of criticism by Glenn and John. We can say this about a whole lot of stuff about what entertainers get, you know, with, uh, you know, what rap musicians make for the value of the cultural c- productions that they offer, or if not mm-hmm. just rap musicians, classical musicians, if you wanted to go into that. I mean, what, mm-hmm. what books is at the top of the New York Times bestseller list? Uh, how could uh, Ibram Kendi be uh, who he is and whatnot? I mean, oh, he's black. I'm sorry, I forgot. I, I'm sorry. Robin DiAngelo then or whatever. There are many places that you could look. I mean, what about uh, uh, executive compensation? You know, people running companies getting paid a gazillion dollars with golden parachutes and whatnot. Uh, I don't know how these athletes' uh, value is actually determined. There must be an implicit auction between teams to see if they can attract well, part the of it with, Part of it with these stars that we're talking about is that they're in demand. I mean, they get to the point where they have to decide which offer to take. And so based on the rules of the market, they have a right to expect twenty, thirty thousand dollars a pop. I remember back in the day, and now money is you know, money's a little bit different now than it was twenty years ago. Tavis Smiley used to get twenty thousand a pop. And oh, this is in this is in two thousand. And he was that much in demand. My and whatever family, happened to Tavis Smiley, he's like disappeared. It was never the same after he kind was of beat Obama. Thing? He did, I don't think the Me Too thing was a little ambiguous. I think it was because he wasn't with Obama, and that meant that he was no longer of interest to the chattering classes. And you stop hearing about him after about 2008, 
nine. I'm sure he's doing his work, but he's not what he used to be. But my family members bring him up regularly. Like talk about how we're not really part of the community. He's still a figure. If oh, so he does have some kind of platform uh, in, in black media or something? To be honest, I don't follow it, but you assume he has a podcast, et cetera. And I don't think that he's he's gone, but he is not the phenom in the general public. NPR would not ha- give him a show today. Yeah, he was And that's a Me people. Too thing, right? I don't know if that's what it was because, I mean, his Me Too was, it was a little ambiguous. It, it wasn't the classic kind of case. I think it was more that he dated some staff members and other staff members thought that it was favoritism, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, we didn't go to detail. I don't know any of the facts, actually, but I do think it's an interesting question about how you rehabilitate. Say you have a regime of Me Too sanction and say your theory of it is that people do bad things. The bad things are very harmful. You want to discourage people from doing them. And so you, in effect, sanction, stigmatize, punish the people who do those bad things when that gets revealed about them. Uh, And, you know, uh, that's that's all well and good. And that punishment takes the form of a diminishment of their status and of uh, people not wanting to do business with them and whatnot. So Tavis can't have the big platform that he could have. Does that is that ever is that permanent? I mean, may, it may be that we can't undo that. It may be that once you get into that, you can't really walk it back. And the punishment has to be permanent, even though you may not start out thinking that it's going to be a permanent sanction. You can't undo it. How do you walk it back? How do you rehabilitate? I think that's a it's, really, it's you need institutions and structures that allow for the vouchsafing of, you know, you, you need a, an anointment. Somebody has to say, somebody has to say, yes, go and sin no more. You know, <laughs> you know memory, memory fades, but it's too soon to say because Me Too is too new. Like Louis C.K. kind of quietly is giving, you know, comedy, comedy routines again. And so there, there's a critical mass of people who forgive him. I don't know if that would be the people who condemned him for what he did. You know, you saw Bill Cosby trying to do it, but I think his transgression oh, no, was Bill Cosby too was vast. Way over and, the top. He, he's a criminal. Conclusive. And, you know, he's got yeah. to go to jail. But, you know, for example, Aziz Ansari, who is... Um, oh, yeah, comedian, yeah, that's an interesting case. And he had a TV role on Parks and Recreation, and then he had this wonderful kind of dramedy on HBO or Netflix, I think it was, Master of None. Great little sitcom that really yeah, tried to okay, make a so statement. We can and we haven't seen that because he had a Me Too where somebody who he had a date with in the past reported him for having been a little, little yeah, disgustingly like aggressive. Yeah, it was just sex or... Uh, no, yeah. no, not sex, but he was just a little too pushy indicating that he wanted <laughs> sex and didn't seem like he completely Anyway, let's not parse the Me Too stuff. You know, yes. Anyway, the point, the point being... Can he come back? And I'm That's sure he my can. Point, yeah. I think his sitcom will come back, and maybe they're even starting to do it now. But it took some years. So, so I'm thinking. Know. I'm thinking like I think a, a game theorist thinks. I mean, I'm thinking that it's secondary sanction. That's the key. So secondary sanction is punishing the people who do not punish the person. Okay. The regime is a regime of punishment. So you don't trade with that person. You don't give them a job. You don't give them a chance. And the only way you can hold that together is that behind it is the message that if you deviate and you're the one who does trade with him, we're going to punish you too. Right. Okay. Right. The, the, the fact that his stigma carries over to those who are prepared to trade with him is really critical to, to many. And I think rehabilitation is going to be facilitated by weakening that, that secondary uh, bond by having there be people willing to come out and take the risk that uh, there seem to be uh, doing yeah. business with the person uh, and not, and know that their reputations themselves will not be too much besmirched by that. Right. There, that will be part of what I sense even now as what will be a national pushback of sorts against the excesses of wokeness. And I'm not talking about Me Too specifically, but yeah, there, there's going to have to be some Spartacus moments where certain people stand up and just say, you can call me what you want to, but I ain't going to take a stand here and say, rehabilitate this person, accept this person, make this statement. And I think it'll get to the point where we get back to the relative sense that, that reigned in about 1997, as opposed to now. But yeah, there's going to need to be that. And I sense that people are beginning to understand that you can push back against this sort of thing and stay alive. And I actually... In the book that I am 
just now possibly going to get out much sooner than I thought. You heard it here first. I don't know anything yet, but my anti-woke book. I end it with a kind of list of entities and people who have stood up to this kind of stuff in 2020 and lived to tell about it. Because I think that we need to make people realize that somebody calling you a racist on Twitter will not end your life. And it will be ever less dangerous the more people realize that Twitter is not the world and you can keep going. So, yeah, yeah, this is something that we're going to see in 2021, I Can suspect, I interview especially, the... especially me. very quickly, especially yeah. because Trump is out and there's often been a standing idea that the excesses of wokeness are necessary because Trumpism and, you know, na race nationalism is on the march. Well, anti-racist, you know, crazy is on the march. That's not going to be true anymore. And so you're not going to have Trump as an excuse for making people cry for not being woke enough. Now, of course, people will find other excuses, but Trump was iconic in that way. So 2021 is going to be interesting in terms of seeing the pendulum maybe shift back to the middle on how we process wokeness. Well, what I was going to ask you when I so rudely interrupted was, and I'll come to Trump, I was going to ask you uh, whether you'd allow me to interview here at the Glenn Show about the book. The book? As soon as yeah, about I, your book, about your as book. soon as I know when it's coming out. No, I mean, of course, I, it appropriately timed. Oh, I, yeah, I want to read about. the book and then I want to uh, I want us to have a back and forth about it, because I think that that could be a very uh, enlightening for me in any case conversation oh, maybe for you. We're doing it. We're and doing maybe it. even for others who might be interested in hearing us do that. And for some people, because all of us have limited time, I shouldn't say this, but that will substitute for them reading the book. I'm quite aware of that. So, yes, we definitely. Oh, no, you want the so. timing to be right. I, mean, I don't want to subvert in any way the, uh, the, the process that you're, you know. Yeah. I'm sure so we'll that, be going through that book is going to happen one way or the other. We will see. But I'm interested also in your thing about the wokeness and Trump and the uh, whatnot. I think you're wrong, actually. I, I think I agree with you that Trump did draw that uh, ire and symbolize that thing. But I don't think he was a particularly impactful force in terms of fomenting or, or promoting anything that was objective, that was actually real in terms of anti-blackness. Uh, you know, people perhaps will disagree with that, but I, I don't, I mean, it was all about, uh, you know, he called places shithole countries and he uh, thought that Obama was not a citizen, uh, whatnot. Well, but, the but, pushback but, but, here would... Uh, the un unraveling of wokeness, that's, and, and, and whether or not uh, unencumbered by Trump, the discourse will indeed be freer. Is, is that yeah. what you're saying? What I'm saying Without is... the necessity to look over your shoulder or why I criticize Black Lives Matter, they're going to think I'm supporting Trump or I'm saying the same thing that Trump is I saying. Would be, I would more yeah. cynically say that that will no longer, longer stand in as a justification for the often self-gratifying, often theatrical excesses. Of wokeness, you could always say there's. But it was never office. an adequate justification. That's that was, I guess, my mm -hmm. point. It was never yeah, an adequate but, justification. There, there's that. I mean, Glenn, though, wouldn't you say what a lot of people say is that the number of explicitly racist groups has gone up since Trump was elected, and many well, people say you that because the he Southern stimulates Poverty it. Law Center. I'm, I, I'm sure that that's true. I, mm -hmm. Do I think that Trump has presided over a, a restitution or a resurrection of anti-blackness? No, I don't think that. And well, what would you say to somebody who said that? I don't, I don't that. see that. I don't see that. I, in fact, I see just the opposite. I see the rise of Black Lives Matter. Uh, I, I see uh, the election of Barack Obama. I see the uh, coronation of Michelle Obama. Uh, I see mm -hmm. LeBron James. Uh, I see Oprah Winfrey. No, I see the National Book Award. I see the New York Times. Are you kidding me? An uh, era of the rise of anti-Black racism? I see a college campus. No, people have their careers canceled for saying the wrong thing about blackface in this country. As Shelby Steele said, Shelby Steele said uh, right here uh, not long ago, there's not enough racism. There's, insuff there's an insufficient amount of injustice. People have to make up affronts. They invent it. You know, so systemic racism, anti-black racism, they, they are on the hunt. It's the theory now is no one had to actually do an anti-black thing. The system is anti-black. 
which invites an interrogation of what the cause of the various disparities are that we see in the world. Whereas mm -hmm. the system arguing people actually never have to tell you. All they have to do is cite the disparity. Kids have lower test scores. That must be a failure of the system. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all a bluff, John, because a careful interrogation of all these areas will inevitably leave one with a substantial amount of weight resting on the extent to which people themselves are managing their lives, raising their families, uh, starting their businesses, and uh, doing the things that are required to be effective in this society. Jails teeming with black people is an indication of the failure of the system? No. Perhaps the system should be reconfigured in light of the fact that the jails are full. Perhaps you want less penalties. Perhaps you want more programs, this, that, or the other. But the first order inference from the fact that I see crime and punishment at an outsized level in a certain community is that there are failures in the developmental processes of that community that leaves criminals preying on people. That's what I think. When I see a school gap, you look at the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which measures fourth, eighth, and 12th grade kids reading and math proficiency. And the fraction of black kids uh, who are at uh, below basic proficiency in their performance on these exams is stunning and vastly higher than the fraction of white kids. You know, to, 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 just let me finish this and, I'll, and I will, you know, to say that that's just systemic racism, Mm -hmm. What it is, is black kids are not being developed to their full human potential. Now, we can begin to have a conversation about why, but the home life is going to have a lot to do with that. Parenting is going to have a lot to do with that. Values, what they uh, hold up as an ideal for a good way of life. People are making choices. Take those choices away from them. You reduce them to chits. On a board, they're making choices. And when you have such disparities as profoundly large and persistent is what I'm talking about right here, there are a lot of black people making the wrong choices. And not because racism is making them do it, you're saying. Well, because you know, that's what. I, 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 yeah, yes, I am saying that. And to imagine that anyone would say that racism is making them make the wrong choices. I mean, imagine the rabbit hole you just went down of self loathing. Racism is making me do the wrong choice. In other words, there is no me. There's no me here. All there is is the forces that are acting on me, making me do the wrong choice. You can't stand up. You can't stand up straight because racism, is, you know, come on, that's despicable. That's disgusting. Yeah, now the, the sociologist is now very angry at you because they say, how dare you misunderstand that, that the problem problem is that black people don't have any agency. I remember people throwing that term at me when I wrote Losing the Race and having to learn what they meant. You're ignoring that, you know, a post-industrial society has left black people except for a very lucky few without agency. But Glenn, what you're getting at is, is this. There needs to be an academic and intellectual revolution about how we think about human societies, about sociology, because the truth is, Everybody knows from early on that math is complicated, especially once you get to algebra and then when you get into trigonometry, everybody knows it's complex. Calculus really knocks you over the head and we all know that higher mathematicians are doing something most of us can't even understand. Everybody knows that astrophysics is hard. Everybody knows that analyzing James Joyce requires a certain difficulty that you're not just gonna, gonna swallow it. Everybody knows that an awful lot went on in history. This gets closer to sociology, but everybody knows there's a lot to know. And that if you're analyzing you know, the rise of industrialism, the, the rise of industrialization in Europe, you've got an awful lot to think about. Everybody, everybody gets that. Everybody gets that music is complicated, art. When it comes to sociology, the higher wisdom is supposed to be that really all of it is very simple. And so... When a person says, look at this disparity, what else could it be but racism? Even if you can't quite perceive it, we'll have to figure out what that is, but it must be racism. And you watch people talking about that. Often they do the thing where they turn their palms out a bit. It's this light sarcasm. What else could it be? And what they mean is they're doing you a favor by even having to explain. They think it's simple. There is this notion that when it comes to sociology, the tenets are easy. 
and that anybody could figure it out. And if you don't understand these basic tenets, like no agency, disparity means racism, then there's a moral problem with you. And you know what? This is something I've never, I don't think I've ever talked about it publicly, but it's been long enough that I think I can say it. I knew somebody who did a study of the average standardized test scores of every major at UC Berkeley. And he didn't share this publicly, but he shared it with me. And what he showed incontrovertibly, I still have the document somewhere, but not in this room, was that if you look at the test scores of all of the graduate students in those departments, and it was a list of like probably 75 different things, the very lowest on the list was education, and the second lowest was sociology. Now, I know that those test scores don't mean everything, but it is not an accident, I think. These are undergraduates? That's the kind of reasoning the, are, These are undergraduates, John? This was graduate students in, oh, okay. in these okay. departments. And you're, it was, you're it was saying about, uh, these, they don't require the higher cognitive functioning? Not the I didn't say, I didn't say that. I didn't okay. say that. But <laughs> the fact that sociology was so much lower than, say, psychology. Have you read any of the... Required. Have you read any of the... I, I think sociology is probably harder than economics. It's it probably not. It, it's, it and, and, and economics is probably harder than physics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sociology uh, should be a field where people are required to think as hard as they are in psychology. Have you but read instead, any... Of, have you read, you know, Marx, uh, Durkheim, Weber, Georg Simmel? I have read Simmel, all three of those people. Yes. And that's complicated. But you're not required to really command that kind of thinking, except on a superficial level. I get the feeling to be. And this is uh, we have to be careful, because, for example, this is not me knocking Mitch Dunayer, who is an excellent sociologist. But I mean, not the, way, the way we are encouraged to think about sociology is as if it's all very easy. We know that math and astrophysics are hard. But when it comes to thinking about society, we're supposed to settle for platitudes and call I think you're selling. Perfect. I think you're selling sociology short. I don't think that's how they think about themselves. Oh, they I, don't I think, think about themselves. I way. think they think society is complicated, and that there are, you know, uh, there are processes and uh, structures and you know whatnot that you can. I mean, I guess we should probably be concrete and you know talk about particular examples. Uh, but I mean, I, here are some of the sociologists that I have. Learn from Peter Berger's uh, The Social Construction of Reality, Berger and Luckman. Uh, uh, Irving Goffman, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, you know, uh, Stigma. This is Irving Goffman. Uh, Robert Merton, you know, uh, Self Confirming uh, Prophecies. I and never actually read him. But yeah. uh, things of this kind. Uh, Orlando Patterson would be a person I think would be on my list. I mean, you know, he, he definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet, Glenn, the problem is you're talking about all of these excellent people. These are people I was introduced to reading sociology. Um, I, Despite what I said about sociology and the GREs, and I'm sorry, but that's just going to have to stand because it was a fact. I'm talking less about academic sociology <laughs> than the way we are encouraged to think about sociology and and what academics let pass as sociology. So, for example, Ibram Kendi, going all around the country, Preaching to people that is he a professor of sociology? Racism. Is I he a professor, professor of sociology? At, at, I think of African American. He's a, one of the first major. I thought it was black studies. I thought it was black studies. African American studies, but he's saying that thing. That is a sociological insight, and it's junk. And yet, all of these academics are standing there in their suits, listening to him say that to their undergraduates in particular, and no one calls him on it, and therefore he genuinely doesn't know that what he's saying is nonsense and underthought. Nobody even tells him. And so that's what I mean. We allow that. Nobody could get up and purvey junk astrophysics or junk French grammar or junk literary analysis all over the country and be celebrated. That's only allowed when it's about societal insights. And I think that we need to get beyond that. Imagine if we were like France, where to be a public sociologist of any kind, you have to be as sharp as Lionel Trilling was. That's something that we miss here in the United States. It's an interesting phenomenon. And that's part of what I think frustrates you and me about who gets to say what out there in public. I'm not worried about it, John. I think it's all going to sort itself out in the end. I think puffery is puffery and uh, substance is substance. Uh, I think we just have to stick to our knitting uh, and stay healthy. 
Uh, I think we win in the end just by the force of uh, the quality of the ideas that have been put forward and the um, and the elocution, the execution. The uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm okay, man. I'm 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 relatively confident about posterity. Okay, I'm not worried about how history is going to view, you know, my interventions and in all these public conversations because uh, we are right, actually, John. Sorry, <laughs> we actually no. it turns out it turns out we're right. <laughs> We are right. When we agree, but we don't always agree, John. I think we are right in our in general stripes. We can be wrong about stuff. I mean, I certainly am, but I think that the general paradigm we're speaking against in a certain future will be proven to be bankrupt. I do think that we're moving towards that. It ha Change happens slowly, which is something that the other side doesn't often seem to want to acknowledge. But the fact that it happens slowly doesn't mean that it doesn't happen at all. I got that from Leon Wieseltier, actually. It's something he wrote at some point. But it's a, oh, it's really? a good point. Yeah, change, you know, j just because change happens slowly doesn't mean that it doesn't happen at all. And so, yeah, and by the way, while we're on um, Professor Kendi, I want to slip something in here because um, he called me a racist. He called me oh, a racist man. online. You he say that, that again? Had, you were called a racist said, by Ibram X. Kendi? Yeah, three names. He... Well, you should, he probably thinks you should be flattered that he called that he deigned to call you racist. He, In fact, he, he acknowledged that you exist that he and deigned then deigned to call you a racist. <laughs> oh, he had, deigned, he had deigned that I existed and his stamped from the beginning, which I didn't say anything about. And um, yeah, he, somebody asked him a question and he said that I have racist ideas. Now, I said on Twitter that I was not going to entertain that comment. And I'm not. I'm not going to defend whether or not I'm a racist. But you know what? That was not necessary. And if he is allowed to call me a racist. You want to public, step outside and settle it like this? <laughs> uh-huh. Metaphorically. He's, young people are going to see that. You know, him with his dreadlocks calling me a racist. And they're going to think that it's actually true. Okay, I'm going to say something about him. Ibram Kendi has been on Twitter saying that if anybody disagrees with him, get this. If anybody disagrees with him, it's not that they have a legitimate disagreement. It's that they couldn't find anything to disagree with genuinely in his ideas. And so they make something up to put out there that he said, and that therefore he takes it as a compliment when anybody criticizes him because he genuinely believes that he could never be wrong. So if somebody has a problem with his stuff, Coleman writing his article about how to be an anti-racist, I suppose me too, we actually understand that his ideas are coherent, but we have to have something mean to say, because I guess we're not nice people. And so, as a result, we make up something that he said, and we jump all over that. And so he takes it as a compliment that he's criticized. You know what? What would if be a specific example of that? Excuse me. I, I'm just trying to make sure I understand the argument. In general, What's an example of something that he says that you construe in such a way as to intentionally misstate it, whatever. It, in general, you know, he has this kind of dichotomous idea that either one is an anti-racist or a racist. You can't be just not terribly committed to the whole paradigm. If you're not terribly committed, you are still a racist. Does he try to and establish that? I didn't read the book. Does he try to show you that that's true, that you have this dichotomy, or does he just assert it? He asserts it and then maybe spends, you know, a certain amount of time exploring it, but not in a way that either one of us would consider exploration. Okay. And frankly, it doesn't work. It's simplistic. He just puts it out there. And he's been called on that many times. Interesting is reading Kelly Fasana, who did a piece on him in The New Yorker. And Kelly's heart is in the black left place. But even Kelly got that this stuff was a, a little Manichaean. But this is the, this is the point. If Kendi really doesn't understand that the nature of ideas is such that if someone disagrees with you, it may be that they understand you completely and they still don't agree. If he doesn't get that, at best, he is extremely inexperienced in the nature of dealing with ideas and argument for somebody with a PhD. That's somebody with a doctorate. At worst, if he really does think that he's come up with something that is that sacrosanct, and that anybody who's criticizing him is just being a jerk, then I think that he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. So, if okay, I'm a racist... Right, i got to make the case for Ibram X. Kendi here, and, you know... One, let me finish. One, one other thing, though. One, okay. one, other, one other thing. 
a little nuance here. He said, I have racist ideas. So he might say, well, I didn't call him a racist. I said he had racist ideas. Well, then I'm going to nuance it. He has dumb ideas. <laughs> and I've been holding off on saying that for about six months. But oh, frankly, God. I don't think he is the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree. It's just, and you're that's signifying now. You're signifying. You know, it's like talking about somebody's mama. Uh, <laughs> no, I, no, what I was going to say was Stamp from the Beginning was an award-winning book. And I don't know it, what did it win. Did it win a Pulitzer? It won something. It won something. Got the national, 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 national Book Award. Yeah. It's Norway Big. That's his uh, first big book. Uh, and it's a history of uh, the stigmatization and exclusion of African-Americans graphically rendered in a way that had a big cachet. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife, Luan, has a copy of that book. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I never read it. Uh, and Me uh, how, how to be an anti-racist that has had huge success. And I mean, doesn't he have like a 10 or $20 million endowed research center at BU? I'm pretty sure that one of the tech companies yeah. dumped a whole bunch of money on him. I used to teach at BU. I still know a few people there, although it's been many years since I've been there. Um, and and uh, he's this iconic uh, figure. Now, you just called him a lightweight. You said he's dumb. John. I don't find him brilliant. <laughs> if you're going to call me, if you're going to call me a racist, I am going to say that because I also get the feeling that many other people feel the same way, but they don't feel comfortable saying it out loud. I think he is a preacher walking around promulgating undercooked, simplistic ideas. Is he a MacArthur never, Prize fellow? And he's never called on it. And you and I both know, as far as the MacArthur and the National Book Award, et cetera, that there is a massive bias among the people who give those awards towards assuaging their white guilt, or if they are a black person participating in making white people feel guilty. And so to be perfectly honest, I'm not saying that Stamp from the Beginning is a bad book, but the kinds of awards that he's getting cannot be taken as indicating that what I just said is not true. And frankly, Glenn, if you read How to Be an Anti-Racist, you would agree with me. It is a very simplistic book. Yeah, I've elected not to. And I should make it clear, the only reason that I'm saying this is because he called me such a terrible thing in public. If that's the way it's going to be, I'm going to be honest too. Well, what, what I think, the reason I've not engaged this literature, and, and I suffer uh, with you, John, I, I regret that you've been called a racist, and I can feel the emotion that you exude and your response, and I, I, I have solidarity with you. I'm in solidarity with you. <laughs> but I think this is all a hoax. <laughs> I think it's all mass delusion. I think it's... Uh, it's a massive uh, denial and avoidance. Uh, I, I do think Shelby still has part of the of the story, which is uh, the white guilt and the the uh, you know people not wanting to be called racist and so you know looking for innocence and whatnot. Like, but I think that's really only I think that's really only part of the story. Uh, this thing with the cops, man, uh, when all these dead bodies of these kids and in, in the you know that this is. You have a movement called Black Lives Matter, and you know uh, you got uh, six-year-old kids getting shot. Uh, I mean, you know, it's almost become a routine kind of thing. Um, so anyway, I won't go off into that. Everybody knows I think about that, and it's people are taking sides and whatnot. But I, I think this uh, uh, is a uh, just is a very deep look at reparations. Think, I mean, think about that, man. Uh, and people are so locked in on the argument, they have such a sense of entitlement, it's breathtaking. Because you're black, you think you're owed something by the universe. You know? It, it's, and, and to be unaware, unselfconscious of how belittling and diminishing building your politics and your, and your, aspiration and your public persona around that. You sell yourself so short. They think of it as a warm cloak. To them, it feels it's, feels self-affirming. It gives them a sense of group membership. They, they enjoy it. Yeah, I, I wonder why anybody would be satisfied with such a narrow mission. I would get so bored. But for them, it means that they're combining their, their mental endeavors with their, their academic toil with being part of a group, with feeling like they, they're on a mission. And um, also, if you're part of that world, 
you are not subject to as much judgment as you would be if you stepped outside and really got into the fray. Because if what you're doing has the fundamental mission of defending black people, very few people are gonna subject it to real critique. Certainly not black people and almost no white people. And if a white person does, they get called a racist and they know not to do it again. And so it's also a world where you're comfortable because you're never made uncomfortable. I've known a lot of black scholars who are you know, doing you know, solid work, sometimes not, but often solid work within that black academia realm. They've never known critique. And frankly, I can see how comfortable that would be. Why would they do anything different than what they do when all they've ever gotten is praise within where they are? They'll never know that what they're doing might not stand scrutiny if they stepped outside. Yeah, I get Robert, it. the economist Robert Frank uh, at Cornell, he has a book called Choosing the Right Pond. It's long, you know, it's 25, 30 years old by now, but it's still readable. And it's all about the strategic uh, dimension of local competition. So, you know, you go here or you go here and you want to choose the right pond. I mean, I, I was uh, interviewed by Megan Kelly along with Coleman on uh, Megan Kelly's podcast not long ago. And she's a Syracuse alum. And she's talking about going to Harvard and she would have probably not fit in and might not have done so well and whatnot, but she was just fine at Syracuse. And, you know, she's now Megan Kelly, who you think about her, what you do. I actually like her myself, but I don't know that. I guess people will not be surprised to hear that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But you choose the right pond and and you kind of know where you are. And, and, and I think that's a very interesting uh, set of ideas because uh, the question of challenging yourself, you know, I think there's just a lot of bluffing going on. I think some of this uh, black academia stuff is people stick together and, and vet each other and pet each other on the back and they avoid ever having to face a fastball on the outside corner. You well, know what if I mean? they do, they think it's racism is the problem. Well, you know? that's a way of avoiding the competition. I mean, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I th- I just think that um, yeah, and but I um I know that what I said about Kendi may sound a little harsh, but it's very harsh, is, John. It's rude, and as a matter of fact, it's rude. But no, not if you're going to call me a bigot in such a public venue when I didn't do anything to deserve it. That that's it. I'm sorry. That's just not nice. And so I'm going to be not nice back. Why do you think? You're saying he's an empty suit, John. Let's let's get graphic. You're you're saying he's vastly overrated. Uh, You're saying he's a joke. You're saying he's a joke. No, I didn't say he was a joke. Well, he's stupid. I didn't say he was stupid, but I I don't find, I do not find him to be engaging in feats of any kind of cleverness. I think it's vastly oversimplified, his ideas. They don't strike me as academic. That it surprises me that he has a PhD, and I think that he's never called on it, and it is a little bit disturbing because people are looking to him as some kind of guru, and he's an example of what I mean in that he is having these sociological insights distributed out there that are not based on what an academic would think of as, as scholarly rigor, and which even non-academics can see through, but are told that they're missing something or are moral perverts if they question I don't think that's good for society. I don't care how much money he makes. I don't think that speaks well for our general intellectual and moral culture. That doesn't bother you at all? Why can't we let a thousand flowers bloom, you know, and uh, instead of us spending our time uh, running down Ibram X. Kendi, Kendi, whose books I haven't read and I'm unlikely to do so, we might just uh, write our own books. Because he is Which is what you're doing. He's the latest kudzu. And illustrate through our labor uh, what we think the right, you know, what we think the, yeah. Ultimately, that is what I will be doing. But I decided I was going to take the gloves off for those 10 minutes. And I did. There are times when you're just supposed to roll with punches like that. But I'm getting a little tired of rolling with punches like that. And so, yeah, I decided to speak, speak my truth on that. And if you read Kendi's work, I'm quite sure that you would feel the same way. Not that he's dumb, not that he's stupid, not that he's an empty suit. Stamped from the beginning was not written by an empty suit. Okay, he's modifying his position, everybody. But I do think that his basic ideas that are getting around are not sound thinking. And 
I think that he should be called on it. To not call him on it is to be racist. I watched him in a public forum say, so you know, like that thing that only white people can write race books about racism. Glenn, do you know that thing? I cannot identify that thing since roughly, you know, the, the 17th century. There's never been a time when- Like I say, man, I'm not paying any attention to this stuff because I think it's racism. all books. He, he, said, he said that and the audience goes, oh yeah, that's right. That's not true at all. A public intellectual- They're, they're acting out a ritualistic thing, man. I, I, it's all a, it's a coon yes. show. It's, it's, it a, is. It's, it's a minstrel it's, show. It's church is what is what it is. And so that is what I am calling out here, that we are not requiring enough. It's the modern day equivalent of Amos and Andy. Uh, and and it, it, it's, it is so um, insulting to black people to not take us sufficiently seriously and, and to, you know, I mean, it's the easiest path, the easiest path for the structures that be, for editorial boards, for prize commissions, for university faculties, for newspaper uh, op-ed writers, for the easiest path for TV uh, talking heads uh, is to uh, patronize and uh, placate uh, these screaming uh, black people who are going around crying about racism, racism, racism. Uh, That is... uh, much hard, much easier than actually doing the work of developing the functioning capacities of the uh, people in uh, the African American population, along with everybody else in American society. But in terms of racial disparities, racial differences, racial inequality, uh, it's 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 much much easier. I mean, uh, so uh, I, I you know. You know? I just think that um, I also wanted to be clear. It's not like I'm, you know, I'm not forging any frontiers like Einstein, well, but I am I'm subject. Sorry. It's important. I'm subject to critique, and partly because some of my ideas are, you know, I wouldn't call them racist, but they're they're un PC, and this includes in linguistics as we've talked about. I get subject to real critique, not only by black authors and scholars, but by white ones, and then of course on my race stuff, I hear where I'm going wrong. And it makes you stronger. You think to yourself, you look and you wipe yourself off and you think that that person is actually right to an extent. And I could make my argument stronger by putting it that way. That's what I think both of us have gone through. That's what being an academic and or a public intellectual is supposed to be. You're supposed to be able to adapt. You're supposed to be building. I like that there are people who criticize my ideas both in and outside of academia But there seems to be this general idea that if the black scholar, if the black public intellectual is, you know, saying the proper woke thing, you don't actually subject what they're saying to any kind of intelligent critique because somehow that's that's a tort. How about this? How about this? The whole uh, vocation of public intellectual is somehow wrongly construed here, uh, such that uh, people like Ibram X. Kendi could be as uh, lionized and successful uh, practitioners of that function. Here's what it should be. You should be a master of some discipline. You should be an economist of the first rank. Yes. You should be a linguist who has a very good publication record in referee journals with a lot of citations. You you should be a physicist who has actually mastered physics uh, or a literary critic who's read the great books and written a few of them who then take this mastery that you have acquired through decades of disciplined study and turn your attention informed by it to the great questions of the day. Your essay should appear in the New York Review of Books the way the New York Review of Books used to be, okay? (laughs) Um, and, And only then should you be anointed a public intellectual, okay? It's quote unquote, worth uh, listening to, worth 10 million or $20 million falling on your center, worth uh, being uh, lionized and awarded and said to be the next uh, whatever. Only then. You ought to have fucking done something. You, you ought to have command of a height so from which you can survey. Here's the deal. 
He's a lightweight, John. He's a lightweight. That's that's the deal. Where is the erudition? Where is the subtle interpretation of a canonical text? Where is the sustained argument? Where's the insight? Where's the mastery? He's a lightweight. You know what? I would only alter what you're saying in that I don't know if a public intellectual has to have decades because that means nobody can be a public intellectual till they're 50. Okay. And also, <laughs> I, don't know if the, I don't know if the person has to All be right. at the tippy, tippy top of their field. That's a lot to require, but the person should be, you know, a, a player, you know, who's a respected person. But well, yeah, there needs to be some depth. There needs to be some resonance. When I strike it, I want to hear the timber. Okay. You know what I don't. You I, I want to feel that I'm in the hands of someone who has surveyed something and who knows something, John. You know what I don't get is there is a conception of this public intellectual we're talking about, where that person never writes refereed articles in journals, or maybe only does it once or twice, where that person never writes an academic book as opposed to a pop book where that person never goes to a conference with a new idea and stands there having to defend it against real questions. I thought that's what being an academic was. Then you choose the public intellectual thing, which frankly in many ways is easier, but you do it on the basis of, yes, having been forged by what I just said. But there's this new idea or alternate idea, because it's not new. What a public intellectual was in the early 20th century was different than what it is now. But there's this idea now that you are a doctor, whatever, and you don't do what I just said. And I think that the defense is that they've chosen to have more of an effect on the world. They've chosen to do something that is different from what I just said about going to a conference and really having to fight. And they would say that the two things are equal and, you know, that's a whole argument. But I'm not sure I get it. If, if How are you an academic if you don't write academic articles and academic books and regularly come up with relatively new formulations of your ideas that you defend against people who look at things in a different way. That's what we did. And we were ordinary. This isn't bragging. This is what you do. But somehow there's this new idea that you are, you've got the, the credentials that we have, but you don't engage in any of that. Instead, you just, you say bitty things, which is what both of us do. You say what you can say on an MSNBC hit. And you give talks where you're adulated, but you don't give conference talks where you're treated as a peer, including being critiqued. I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I get that. I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. I thought a public intellectual had to have something behind them other than writing the pop books. And I now write mostly pop books, no doubt. Some academic books that nobody's ever heard of. But yeah, the pop stuff is important to me. It's overtaken the academic to an extent. I hate to admit it, but it's true. But I started doing what we just said. I thought that was the pathway. I guess there's a justification as to why that's changed. I don't know. Well, John, um, I, I don't know. I think we have a conversation here. We might want to call it a day and, <laughs> and save some of the other topics for another occasion. Uh, we're going to be talking every other week, so uh, there's plenty mm -hmm. of opportunity going forward. Uh, we yeah. are in the post-Trump era. I don't want anybody, <laughs> viewers who think that I somehow am a closet Trumpy and to think that I'm a dead ender. Uh, that could be the subject of our next conversation if you want to have it. It looks like uh, uh, Trump is going to fight out to the uh, end through the courts and whatnot. And it's we, such we a, definitely it, need to talk about that. Definitely. Tragic uh, for our country, and you said Shakespearean in our pre-conversation. You you said Shakespearean. I think that's a very apt reference. So why don't we why don't we do that? Uh, I would like this is advertising for the Glenn Show with Glenn and John, uh, who are at patreon.com forward slash Glenn Show. Uh, I think we ought to read Obama's memoir and and parse it. I can do that. We should because to know to tell you the truth. I never read any of the others. That's not my genre. Um, I was a great fan of the man, as you know, but I did not read his dreams of his father. So, yes, I would like to read what he has to say these days. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, let's put that on the agenda. So, signing off for now. Thanks a lot, John. Thank you, Glenn. You're welcome.